Technology brings us better things. New inventions, neat new gadgets, things coming all the time, right? New diseases conquered, on and on and on. I mean, we've seen pretty much unbroken for the last hundred years or more real progress in many ways, not in all ways, believe me, but real progress in a lot of things in society. But we fail to realize, I think, just how fragile society is in many ways. And I would say that the fall of Rome shows how quickly society can take a step backward. How quickly society can move backwards and how the things we take for granted, the infrastructure, the law, the government, the schools, the whole system, how quickly it can vanish. Every once in a while you'll see one of these movies that, you know, thinks of a um, post-nuclear exchange world, right? You know, where there's been all these nuclear bombs go off and they're trying to rebuild society, you know, and it's all primitive and they all live sort of like, you know, um, cavemen, so to speak, almost. And it's all this primitive world. You know what? That is somewhat what it was like after the fall of Rome. These these structures and these um, things that were so dominant in society were now gone. Well, what, what sort of filled the vacuum? One of the things that partially filled the vacuum was something we're going to consider for sort of our last topic of the night, and that was the monastic movement. You could say that in this Christian empire period, after the fall of Rome... Christianity retreated to the monastery. The monastic movement was a reaction to the fall of Rome and to the social unrest that came after it. You see, as the church became more institutionalized and less and less of a real living organism, the the church became more of a corporation, the, the Bible became less available, and Christians became far more superstitious. In this time, you could say that True Christianity, at least in the perception of the population, became more and more the domain of monks and nuns. You see, the monastic ideal was based on an even more ancient idea of the hermit. The hermit began to emerge in the early church period. The hermit lived all alone, usually in a barren wilderness, and their solitary life supposedly gave them a closer communion with God. Now, this seclusion was sometimes necessary in times of persecution, but later most of the Christian community thought that this was the way that a person could have the closest walk with God possible. So the hermits would retreat to the desert. The the first monk of any kind of note is a guy named Anthony the Hermit. Uh, He lived in the desert of Egypt, and he was deeply impressed by the story of the rich young ruler, and he applied the words of Jesus to the rich young, of the words of Jesus to the rich young ruler, he applied them to himself. So he sold everything, he gave his money to the poor, he said goodbye to everybody, and then he lived alone. First he lived alone near his house. That wasn't good enough. Then he lived alone in a graveyard. That wasn't good enough. Then he lived alone out on a lonely mountain. Twice a year, friends would bring him food, and he drank nothing but water. He decided to never comb or cut his hair except at Easter. And as typical for many hermits, Anthony described strange visitations of demons and temptations in the wilderness that were intended to distract him from his relationship with God. Another very notable group of hermits were called the Stylites or the Pillar Saints, Uh, There's more on Anthony the Hermit, you know, this artistic depiction of him enduring temptation from different demonic beings out there all alone in the wilderness. But then there was Simon Stylitis, or the Stylites. They were known as the Pillar Saints. They took their name from a certain Simon, or Simeon, who died in 459. Simeon imagined that by living on the top of a pillar, his soul would be closer to God. So he started with a pillar six feet high and gradually increased the height of the pillar until he lived for 30 years on a pillar that was 60 feet high. He had many visitors who preached, and then he would preach to the visitors from on top of the pillar. The Stylites were a group that followed Simeon upon his pillar. Not upon his pillar, you know, there's only room for him on top of his pillar, but they got their own pillars, and they were here just in communion with God on top of their pillar. 
Now, these guys were kind of forerunners of this monastic ideal. Again, notice the sense that you separate yourself from culture. You separate yourself from society if you really want to seek God and draw closer to Him. That was the idea. And so there were many different monastic orders. They were usually distinguished by their dress and by their particular rites. They were usually named after their founder, right? The Benedictine order was founded by Benedict. The, the Franciscan order was founded by Francis, and so on and so on. Now, the monastic movement, was it good or was it bad? Well, it was bad in the sense that it cultivated a false idea of spirituality. The idea was that if you were really committed to God, you would shut yourself off from the world and live in the cloister. This led to what you might call a two-level system of Christianity, where the real Christians lived as monks, and the low-level Christians lived in the outside world. Now, again, not every monastic order was cloistered. Some orders actually went out preaching the gospel and meeting the practical needs of people. And so it was a mixed bag, right? But in general, I think that monasticism, in many ways, had a bad influence because of these things, because of this radical separation of the world. And basically what it said is that you can't be a really good Christian and live a normal life. If you're going to be a really good Christian, you have to go to the monastery. That's not a healthy thing. Now, what was good about monasticism? Monasticism was good because it provided a place where some kind of learning and culture could survive the general breakup of society after the fall of Rome. You see, at their best, monasteries were like intense discipleship schools and their disciples went out and did ministry. And this is what they did in some cases. For example, we see that in this period of the uh, Christian Empire, in the early part of it, monks really spread the gospel in Europe. And so they went out to the Goths, who were converted by 720, to the Picts by 400, to the Irish by 435, to the Franks by 496, to the Scots by 563, and to the Angles and Saxons by 600. This was the monastic movement at its best, serving basically as radical discipleship schools to send forth the monks into the world to have an impact. But we must say sadly that the monasteries all too often did not function at that high ideal. So in some ways monasticism was bad, in some ways monasticism was good, but I'll tell you what, monasticism was useful because new monastic movements were created to absorb reform movements within the church. Listen, whenever an energetic, popular reformer came along and said, hey, the church is messed up, we need to do things different, you know what they said to him? Great, start your own monastic order. Gather around you a bunch of people who feel like you do, and then separate you from the rest of normal Christians, right? And you can do your reform among your own believers in a radical way. This was useful for the church with the monastic movement because it had a way of sort of absorbing and, and taking in monastic movements. Well, th there's more we'll say about monasticism, uh, but this will be it for this lecture, other than just to take a look back and take a look at these general trends. On the one hand, you have the church moving from the persecuted minority to the privileged majority and all the changes that go along with that, and very much as part of this increasing, you might say, carnality in the church, monasticism was a reaction against that. Next time we're together, we're going to get in more in the Christian empire. There's a lot more for us to learn in that.